how to use DaVinci Resolve for beginners. I'm not exactly a professional video editor, but I'm about to tell you everything that I've learned about DaVinci Resolve so far. Hey friends, it's me, Jenny, and today I wanted to do a video about how to use DaVinci Resolve for beginners. Up until about a year ago, I was using Sony Vegas Pro and After Effects for all my video editing needs, but then I discovered DaVinci Resolve, gave it a try, and turns out that I actually really like it. It's super user-friendly. Let me know if you have any questions or if you have any tips that I missed. First things first, when you open up DaVinci Resolve, you'll notice the Project Manager. If it's your first time opening up the project, it's going to look pretty bare. And once you have some projects in here, you'll have a bunch to choose from and you'll have nice little previews with thumbnails. You can choose between list and thumbnail view right here in the project viewer. You can also use this little slider to make your thumbnails bigger or smaller. And right here on the left is where you can toggle a list of databases or create a new database for where you want your projects to be saved. This is really important if you never set a database specifically because you may wonder where are my projects being saved? I actually had to look into this a while back and found out you can actually choose where your database is. If you've already started a project and you don't know where it's saved, when you have the project manager open, you can right click on the database and say open file location and that'll show you where DaVinci Resolve is saving your project files. Now right here, you can create a new folder or a new project, and this can be useful if you're making videos with different themes. Say you have a YouTube channel and you have vlogs, gaming videos, and educational videos, so you might want to have a few different folders in your project manager. That way it's easy to keep your projects separate and easier to find them. So we can make a folder for all of our vlogs and double click on that to get inside, and then we can click on new project to create a new project which will be saved right here in this database. I personally like to save all my big projects on my solid state hard drive, so you could create a new database and right here under create, you can choose post GRE SQL. Just make sure to select this option right here when you go to save on your solid state hard drive. You can name the database Jenny database and then don't change the password or username of this right here unless you know what you're doing. And then you can press create at that point and this will create a new database. So this is if you want to choose where it's going to save all your project files, then this is what you would do is make a new database. That way you can make sure that you know where your project is being saved and you can access it easily later. When you create a new database, you can actually choose whether you want it to be saved on your computer, which is the disk, or if you want to save it on an external hard drive, which sometimes can make things move a little faster. My hard drive is a solid state hard drive, which in general is a lot faster than regular hard drives or my computer disk drive. So that's why I like to save my projects on the solid state hard drive. So you'll see right here the databases that are saved on your disk are up here and then the ones on the solid state are down here. And once you're ready to create your new project, well, you can create the new folder. Jenny folder. Double click to get inside that folder and then make your new project. We'll just say DR for DaVinci Resolve. Once your project is open, notice the little toolbar at the bottom. I use this all the time to quickly navigate to the main areas of the program. And I'll try to go through each one of them at a time, but I'll tell you right now that what I would do if I'm trying to hurry up and edit a video, as soon as I open up my project, I'm going to go here to the edit tab and I'll just drop my videos right here into the timeline. You don't even have to go to the media pool or anything, but you can. It's just, if you're trying to do a project real quick, this would be the fastest way to go about it. Just click on the edit tab, open up your folder wherever you have your files that you want to put in the video. And I just have two videos right here that I want in this project. So I'm just gonna highlight both of them and drag them into my timeline. This right here is a notification that says that the clips have a different frame rate than the current project settings. I like to import my clips this way. If my clips are recorded with 30 frames per second, like I do sometimes when I'm streaming, then I can make sure that the timeline of the project will adapt to whatever the video files are. So we'll just say change the timeline to fit the videos as opposed to the other way around. Another way to get started with your project is to go to your bottom toolbar on the left where it says media. Right here is another view of your media files and some other options for media and organizing your media files. Right here is your master media pool. And once again, you can use the slider to make your previews bigger or smaller. And you can use the thumbnail or the list button right here to show you. If you have a ton of files, it might be easier to use the list because then they're alphabetical. You can also organize the things in your list by clicking on these little buttons up here. And these will arrange them based on the order. So if you're trying to organize all your videos from the longest first, then click right here under duration and you can find all your longest videos first. That can be helpful if you have a few long videos 
that you wanted as the majority of your project and then a, some smaller ones too. This way you can find them all at once, right at the top of your list. Only the list has that option to reorganize, so when you have the thumbnail view, you don't have that list option. If you want to search for your file by name, then just click on the little search icon here and type in the file name. A lot of the buttons in DaVinci Resolve are toggles, like the magnifying glass is a toggle, so you can click on it and it'll just toggle that search bar. Sometimes I forget how to find things and I realize that something was just toggled, so... Uh... Like right here, the, the master preview area can get toggled. So if you're trying to make more room to see your files, you can do that. This panel can also be toggled by clicking on that little preview button. Something else helpful that you can do in the media pool section, you can right click on your video clip or you can right click on the timeline right here in your media pool and you'll see some different options which are really helpful. Different ways to do certain things like you can just drag your files into the project or you can right click on here and you'll see import, export, all these different cool options. You can even duplicate your timeline. Oh yeah, you can also toggle your media storage if you want to if you want to preview your scene here and still have your media pool down at the bottom. You can experiment with the different toggles and sometimes I've even discovered different tools by doing that. <laughs> the next button on the bottom blah. So the next button on the bottom tab is cut. I'll be honest, I haven't exactly used this tab as much, but there are some different cut tools right here and in general, anytime you hover over a tool, you'll get a little tool tip. If you don't know what these little icons mean, just hover over it for a couple seconds and then it'll tell you right here. Like you can choose to see only the video only or just the audio only. The little magnet is a snap tool, so if you want your clips to snap to one another when you're dragging them back and forth. Quick export? Oh, that's cool. I didn't ever... I never saw the quick export before. So you can right click and change the clip color. Sometimes that can be helpful to find the stuff that you're looking for. But my favorite tab to work in is the edit tab. The edit tab is the one that's the most like Sony Vegas Pro, Timeline, or any of the other softwares that I've used. And if you want to rearrange the size of your windows, don't be shy. You can definitely rearrange the size of most of these windows. Sometimes you kind of have to like hover over the edge of the windows to see where exactly you're able to move it. But just look around long enough and you'll find the areas where you're able to adjust the windows. Okay, cool. So under the edit tab right here, Generally, there's a few different ways to do everything that you can do in this program. One way is by looking underneath these tabs up here at the top. If you're trying to edit your clip, just make sure that that clip is selected. And then when you click on clip, you'll see all the options under here are available. They might all look grayed out if you forgot to select your clip. So just make sure that you've selected the clip that you're trying to edit and then you'll see these options. When you're getting ready to edit your clips and trim them and overlap them and stuff like that, Right here, these little icons are super helpful. Trim, edit mode, and these also have the shortcut commands on here as well. So a lot of the time I might be using these tools by just clicking on shortcuts. And once you have the most basic ones memorized, then it's easy. So if you want to select your clip, right here this little arrow is the selection mode icon. You can also press the letter A and that's the shortcut for select. And B is for blade, and B for blade is right here blade for edit mode, so I usually toggle between A and B all the time. A for select and B for break, or blade, <laughs> I guess. Um, if you want to break the clip, if you want to use the blade to cut it, A and B. We just have two media clips right now in our timeline, and the first one is this sky, and then this other one is this super short little clip right here. This little short clip does not have any audio, and also when you grab it, you can just drag it upward. That will create a new track in your timeline, and then you can drag this above the first clip anywhere, like at the very beginning here. And that's all that is. It's just a little pop-up. I want this pop-up to be pretty small, like up in the corner of my main clip. When you want to change the transform or the size of a clip, then you can do that over here in the inspector window over on the right. You can toggle the inspector window right here. So if you don't see it, just click on the word inspector and it'll bring this up. And right here is where you can choose to zoom and to go back, just press control Z if you're on PC. So you can use the transform tool over here. You can click on this little icon and that turns on or off the edit mode. And the edit mode is that which is underneath this little arrow. Any of these items down here are cool. I actually use these all the time, so when you have this selected, then you can edit this stuff. You can grab the corners right here in the actual preview pane. So the different options under this menu are transform. Transform is for moving around, or you can grab the corners and change the size. 
Also right here in the middle of the transform is going to be like the center pivot of your clip. If you want to change where the pivot is, then you just grab onto the center circle and move it however you like. I just want it like right up here, like a little um, pop up. You can use your scroll wheel to zoom in and out of your preview pane right here. You can also use this percentage over here where it says fit. You can do like 50% or 6%. <laughs> Let's just do fit. So the transform tool is necessary all the time. I use the transform tool. And then the next thing under here is crop and cropping is for when you don't want to save the same size. You actually want to chop off the sides of your clip. So you can see that'll actually crop the clip however you like. <laughs> this can be helpful if you have stuff around the edges that you actually don't want. Right now it's all see-through around the edges so we don't actually need the crop tool but just to show you how that works. Also you can use crop over here in the inspector and you can turn any of these features on or off by using this little toggle button and also double click on here to open up the crop options and this is also where you can adjust the crop in the inspector. So then the next option down here is dynamic zoom and dynamic zoom is also right here. It's turned off at the moment. So turn that on and double click on it to see what those options are. Basically the dynamic zoom is cool because it'll animate between these two boxes. So there's this smaller green box and this bigger red box and the dynamic zoom will kind of like zoom between these two boxes. So say I want we would never want this, but say we want it <laughs> to start on one corner and we want it to animate to the other side of the corner. Just put those boxes wherever you want the clip to start and finish. And you can see a little example there how it moves. Say that the dynamic zoom is moving in the opposite direction and you actually want it to move the other way. Just press on this little swap button and that will swap the direction that it's going. So that's really helpful if you want it to go the other way. You don't actually have to edit those boxes again, just press the swap button and you're good to go. And that just swaps them for you. And if you change your mind and you don't want to use the dynamic zoom, then just turn that off and you can keep your settings there for later in case you change your mind again. Next under here is the OpenFX overlay. I'm not actually totally sure what the OpenFX overlay is, so we're just going to skip that for now. <laughs> and annotations that I only know about those like in YouTube. So we're going to skip those last two. So you can use your blade tool and cut your media and then you can press A to select it and move it around. You can also create a new bin or folder right here in your media pool by right clicking and going add bin. When you're in your timeline, you'll notice that the tracks will actually create another track. If you go to drag your media into a new track, you might notice that the audio goes onto a different track as well. But if you don't want that to happen, just go over here and click on the lock icon and that will lock the audio track. And that way, if you want to move this one, you can. You can also separate this from the audio, but you very well may not want to do that because especially if you have audio that you need to have synced with a talking mouth or something. <laughs> I definitely want to be careful not to get your audio out of sync if you wind up using this lock feature. This video doesn't actually have any audio in it, so um, the audio track in this file actually doesn't have any audio on it, so it looks like there's... Um, the audio track for this media is actually silent, so there's no waveforms here, but if this did have a, a song or any type of audio, and if you're not able to see the audio wavelengths right here where there's just a straight line, normally there's a wavelength, you can go over here to this track icon and here's where you can choose all these different personalized settings for how you want your track to appear, both for the media and for the audio timeline. Right here and same thing, uh, stacked timelines, that's if you have more than one. Subtitle tracks, that's if you have subtitles and audio waveforms. So that's if you want to see the waveforms or not. You may not need to see them if you don't have any audio like how we are. Normally I always want to edit with the waveforms visible. That way I can make sure to make the blade cuts in the right places. Here's another option for the audio view. And if you don't see it how you want, just go here and try some of these different views and see how you like it because different people have different preferences and I personally like really big um I personally like to be able to see a preview of my video right here but that might get so big you don't you may not actually need to see that so big you might need to do more audio editing and so you can drag this slider up to make the audio file bigger and that's really helpful when you are actually cutting between wavelengths between words and whatnot the timeline view options are really cool because you can make sure that you can see the waveforms on your audio tracks and you can adjust the size right here. 
you can mute your tracks and you can mute them in a couple different ways, both your video and the audio tracks. Right here on the video track, you'll see these little icons and this one looks like a film strip. If you click on that, it actually turns off the visibility of your media right there, that, of that particular track. There's the lock icon and that just locks it so that you don't accidentally do something. Even if you have the lock turned on, this track will still render. However, if you have this turned off, then it will not render that track. If you're trying to turn down the visibility or audio of one particular media file, but not the entire track, but you have them on the same track together, you can edit those individual media tracks right up here in the inspector. Just make sure you have the correct video clip selected, and then you can go over here to the opacity. And this can make it completely see-through or black. If there's nothing behind it or underneath this track, then you won't see anything when you make this invisible. Right now it just looks black. But if there was a track beneath it, then you would be able to see that other track underneath. Just like in a lot of other video or photo editing software, you have the different composite modes right here. And these are really cool if you're trying to get a cool video effect. And I like that you can choose this per clip and it doesn't have to be for the entire track as well. I like to use the additive blend quite a bit. But most of these, you won't even notice a difference unless you have several tracks stacked up on top of one another. We'll choose this media file that is stacked on top of our blue sky. And just to give you an idea of, you know, what it looks like, you can make that 50% transparent. Or you can go over to the composite mode and choose additive and you can see how it looks a little bit different. Sometimes it looks cool, other times you might not be able to see whatever is behind it correctly. It just depends on what colors each file is. The color dodger is really cool. Oh, darken. All these different good options. <laughs> All these fun options to choose from. When you have your media selected that has an audio file on it as well, then when you're looking at the inspector mode, you'll see the video options and all these fun things to adjust the video file. But then right next to it is the audio tab. And this is where you can choose to adjust the volume of the audio. You got the clip volume right here and you can pan from left to right. You can actually make keyframes along your timeline for different things like adjusting the clip volume. But if you want to just fade in or fade out at the beginning or end of your file, then you don't actually have to use the keyframes necessarily. At the very beginning of our project, let's say we want it to fade in over the course of five seconds or something. Just hover towards the top corner of your clip and you'll see this little... Just hover by the top corner of your file and you'll see this and you can drag it by going left and right. And that is just a fade. And so you'll see how it slowly fades into view like that. So you can do the same thing with the audio, with the fade. You can fade on your music. I use the audio fade all the time for my YouTube videos and sometimes I'll be talking and the music will be a little bit louder if I'm not talking and then when I start talking again, the music goes down. So this is really helpful. So this audio track doesn't actually have any audio, but just to give you an example of what it looks like. By the way, to zoom in and out of your timeline, you can use this right here. And it'll zoom into, if you're trying to zoom in, it'll zoom in wherever your cursor is on the timeline. You can use that awesome zoom tool up here, or you can hold down alt and use your, you can either use the plus or minus right here to zoom in and out, or you can hold, hold alt and use your mouse scroll wheel to zoom in like this. You can see this node in the middle, this little node right here. This actually adjusts the way the fade in or out goes. Basically the audio will fade in or out based on the shape of this, which is kind of cool. Between your clips, when you're trying to merge different clips, you can just select them right here between, right click, and then choose how long you want the crossfade to be. And when you zoom in, you can see there's the crossfade right there. And it's pretty much the same clip, so you won't really notice a difference. But if those were two different clips, you would see a crossfade between them. Often there's quite a bit of layering that happens in videos. So one thing that's helpful is being able to move the tracks up and down real easily because you can move them like this, but you might want to move the entire track and you can just right click and say move track up or move track down. And then you can also say right click and add track. And generally that'll just add a track to the very top right here. So you might need to move that track down. And so you want to have a track at the very bottom. That's how you add a new track. If you're trying to remember different parts of your timeline, then you can right click anywhere on your timeline and say add marker. And the little markers will show up right here at the top. So that can kind of maybe help you gauge like where do I want my intro to start or where do I want this other section to start. When you have the markers, you can rename the marker by double clicking on it. 
And you can even manually put in the time that you want that marker right here as well. So you can, you can title the marker and add some notes. You can even add keywords so that you can search for this later. If you're trying to select and move your clips in your timeline, you can do that a couple of ways. One way is to click and drag to select all your files or um, the files that you want and move them that way. Or you can just press Control A because A is select, but Control A is select all in your timeline. When you're trying to edit your clip attributes, you can do so by right clicking to remember some of these different options. One tool that I use all the time is right clicking on my clip and going to change clip speed. I like using the change clip speed because I like using percentages. So if my video is at 100% speed right now, but I want it to be four times as fast, I'll just put 400 right here, 400% and that'll make it four times as fast. When you go to preview your video, once you've added some effects like speeding it up or something, the preview might not look as good, like especially not while I'm recording. You can also select some of these other things like reverse speed, freeze frame. Freeze frame is when you want to like pause it on one frame and like talk for a few seconds and then continue the video after that frozen frame. I like that feature quite a bit actually. If you're working with keyframes, you can also choose right here whether to maintain timing or stretch to fit. You can type in the clip duration right here, but this is the same thing as just dragging it. You can change the length of your clips by grabbing the edge of your clip and just dragging it. And you can see those white guidelines. Those are showing you where the clip begins and ends. Say you've got this clip, you press B to break, you break it, A to select, and then select this clip. You can press delete. You can select that portion that you want to delete and press delete. That'll delete your selected clip and move everything else closer to the rest of your project. However, if you want to delete this portion without moving anything else, then just press backspace instead of delete. And then once again, when you grab the edge of that clip, it'll show you where it originally ended um, based on those guides around the edge. That can be helpful if you're trying to get your clip the same size it was before, or you're trying to get to a different part that was in that clip. In addition to doing that regular crossfade transition, you can also choose to do other cool transitions by clicking on the effects library. And under the effects library, you'll see these options like video transitions, audio transitions, and there's a lot of other options here too. So if you don't like the classic crossfade or if you want to get more creative, there's a lot of different options here, a lot of which I'm not really interested in personally. I think a lot of these are a little bit too much for me, but it's nice to see that they have these options and some of them can be really fun. Let's see, some of these other options are the additive dissolve. I like the additive dissolve. That one can look pretty nice. The blur dissolve, and it'll just blur between the two, the two clips. These are all really fun to try out and there's just so many of them, so I definitely recommend taking some time and trying to figure out which are your favorite effects to use because for me I know that I always come back to my favorite effects and I like to use them over and over again. <laughs> so here's the cool video transitions, audio transitions. Some other really cool features that you can find under the effects library are the generators. I love the generators because for YouTube videos you might have you know text overlay but you might also want to have background with the text. You might want to customize your text overlays. They have a ton of really cool text templates for overlays and pop-ups, all these different titles and effects that you can customize. You can also choose from the list of generators and these will give you... My favorite one lately has been the four color gradient. This is something that you'll see in After Effects as well. And you can edit this by checking out the inspector and then choosing these however you like them. I personally like a little bit more of a pastel look. This is one of my favorite gradients lately. By the way, if you can't grab onto the edge of your clip, then you might need to just zoom in until you can. So you can make that gradient a lot longer if you want. Also, you can fade it on like this. So the, the generated gradient can fade on like that. Say you want to add some text on top of that generator, then you can just go over here to the titles. Here's the most generic titles and texts right here at the top, and then all the crazier ones start to happen down here. So I would just go to text and drag that right above my generator, and you can make that as long as the generator itself. There's other ways to do this too. I'll show you in a moment another way to do this using nodes. So right here is the text and you can edit the text right here or um, also here's the font family and you can choose any font. Once you go onto here and you choose any font, like say this one, it looks like uh, they don't exactly have the best font previewer here. So you have to actually choose each font individually. 
to see what it looks like inside of here. Otherwise, you can preview your fonts and windows or something. Okay, cool. So here's the size. You can change the size of the font right here, which is a good idea because you could use the transform tool and change the size of the font by using this here transform tool. But you might not want to do that because it's better to change the size of the font from right here inside the inspector because the transform tool at a certain point will actually start to show the resolution. So say, say the text was really, really small. Like you would not want to use the transform tool because it just won't look as good of a quality. It'll, it'll look kind of blurry, you see? So whatever you do, <laughs> if you forget about that transform, turn that off. Turn off that transform, go back to the text and just use that size slider instead. And that way it'll keep that nice, the outline of your text, that nice vector line of your text. I would recommend using the transform tool on the text sometimes. So that's one way to do a title. You can also grab this text plus and you'll see that that just looks like that. Don't forget to save your project periodically. You can just press control S to save or you can go file and then save project. So the text plus basically means that it includes the background. So you know how we added that color gradient? Well, the text plus comes with its own background. You can click on the fusion button on the bottom toolbar and that'll bring you into this option here where there's nodes and you can actually, you can edit your video using nodes in DaVinci Resolve as well. I'm still learning how to use the nodes in the fusion tab, but you got a couple of different preview panes right here and you can choose whether or not these are visible on both of the paint, both of the panes or not. You can also add different things right here in the fusion tab, such as a background. And to attach this to our title, we would just grab this and drag it. That creates a merge node and it merges to the media output. Although I think it should go like this. <laughs> okay, I guess whatever. <laughs> Alright, so say you bring in the text plus and you want to add a background, you can just come in here, add the background, and then when you click on this, this is where you can choose the color for the background. So if you can't see the thing that you're editing, just make sure that these little dots are turned on and that is that means that they'll be shown. When in doubt, I'll just go back to my edit button. All right, I think that we accidentally deleted our text that time. Using the nodes will take some practice. I'm personally still practicing using the nodes as well. I don't totally know how to use the nodes entirely, but in the fusion tab, when you are editing with the nodes, this can be really fun. I think I just need to learn a little bit more about it. Layout, transform, shading image you can add an image to your text plus if you want we can add text from in here and add more text oh there's that shit i don't really know how to use the fusion tab very well <laughs> i'll be sure to do an update video when i learn a little bit more about the fusion tab all i know is that it's really cool and it's another way to do things like add layers and add text on top of those layers and even paint directly on top of those layers right here is the paint tool so that's really cool there's even some 3D tools over here, which I believe mimic 3D in DaVinci Resolve. But in no way is DaVinci Resolve a 3D program. Like if you want to work in a 3D space, then I would recommend Blender or um, 3D Max or something else like Cinema 4D. Here in DaVinci Resolve, there are some 3D tools, but it kind of will give the impression of 3D. You're definitely not going to be working in a 3D space. Are you going to add this 3D text? Anyway, <laughs> we'll come back to that. Under the color tab, this one's really awesome if you know anything about color grading or adjusting the colors. And this is definitely a professional tool right here. They have a lot of really fun tools like this in After Effects and plugins as well. I remember there was this one plugin I used to use in After Effects called Magic Bullet Looks and that was one of my favorite plugins. And this kind of reminds me of that, but a lot of these are things like you would have to change on your own. You probably don't want to mess with the color tab too much if you don't know much about color theory or color grading. I personally haven't really used this tab too much. However, one thing that I do in the color tab is say you want a still image from somewhere on your timeline, you have to come over here to the color tab and right click on the preview and say grab still. And that still will come over here and you can say right click and then export and that's how you would export your image. And right here you might want to choose PNG or whatever and that's how you would save your picture. 
Yeah, since I don't really know too much about the Fusion Color or Fairlight tabs, I'm going to just breeze over these real quick. The Fairlight tab is for when you're editing your audio, and this is also a little bit more advanced. So if you are using a bunch of different tracks of audio, or you're trying to get different effects, add a little bass or something like that, then this is the tab for you. Personally, when I'm editing my audio, I'll usually use Fruity Loops or Cool Edit Pro, but there's some really cool free programs as well for audio engineering, such as is that one called uh, audacity you can use audacity and that's a free audio editing program but if you don't even want to bother with that but you do want to make some adjustments to your audio you can do so right here in davinci resolve as well you can mute the tracks you can single them out um, i would personally be doing this on my main tracks or i would be doing the same thing in the edit from the edit tab but this is just another way to do it where it's focused on the audio so if I want to mute my audio tracks, I usually would just do that over here in the edit tab. Yeah, I would just edit my audio right over here. But if you want to get more advanced, then definitely check out that Fairlight tab. Because right here you've got, sometimes they do not have tooltips, but almost everything in this program does have tooltips. <laughs> Some of these smaller icons do not though. This one stands for mute. You can mute the track. S I believe means single. The next thing is exporting your video and making sure that you got all the right settings. Press on the deliver button down here at the bottom toolbar and this will take you to your export page. I was so excited when I saw that there's these default settings for YouTube or Vimeo. YouTube automatically compresses your videos so this was really cool because you can just go right here and it has all the best settings for YouTube already. Sometimes with Sony Vegas Pro I wouldn't really know like what are the best settings and sometimes my render would actually look a little bit fuzzy. Turns out that in Sony Vegas Pro, you have to adjust the interpolation mode sometimes, and the interpolation would look fuzzy. I just was not really into the defaults in Sony Vegas Pro, and right here in DaVinci Resolve, they have the perfect settings for YouTube, and also Vimeo does not compress videos like how YouTube does. You can just, of course, do the regular custom settings here if you want to have more control. Usually, I like to start on the YouTube tab, and then I'll go from there. You can actually go all the way up to 4K. So you can choose 4K, you can choose the resolution right here. You can go down to 1280 by 720 if necessary, but for YouTube, you shouldn't have to. The only reason why I would suggest turning down the resolution if you have to is if you're strapped for space on your computer or for some reason your computer just can't handle gigantic files. Um, otherwise, I would just keep the regular 1920 by 1080, the frame rate at 30, which is what this project file is by default. But you would want to make sure that if you have the option or if any of your video files have 60 frames per second, just make sure that you include all 60 frames right here. Depending on what you're rendering your video for, you may need to check and just see what are the best settings for my particular project. But if you're just trying to render out a video for YouTube or Facebook or Instagram TV or anything like that, this is the place to go right here under YouTube. And also you can choose custom size. Say you're trying to edit a video that you want to put on Instagram and you can right here change the size, the dimensions of your videos. So for Instagram TV, you just have to swap the dimensions be 1080 by 1920. But this will just render out that size. This won't actually show you the preview of what that looks like. So this is the render settings. If you want to make sure that you're editing in the same dimensions that you're going to be rendering in, I recommend checking your project settings at the very beginning. That way you have it all set up the way you want from the get-go. If you're trying to make a video for Instagram TV, then you'll want to have the correct document settings from the very beginning. That way you can see what it looks like. If you weren't able to get the correct document settings at the very beginning, then you can go under File, go to Project Settings, and right here is not just the export settings, but also the project file settings. The pixel aspect ratio, you don't ever want to change that. This is different than the dimension of your actual video. This is actually the shape and size of your pixel. And the pixels are the tiny little dots that make up your entire video frame. So um, there's a lot of other crazy things that you can choose here as well. Right here, the playback frame, you can choose 60 right there. But even if you change your project settings to 60 frames per second as a preview, you might not see that 60 frames per second over here under the Deliver tab. Now you can see an example of how we have a portrait size video. And if you have a hard time selecting a video clip, just click off of the video clips or click anywhere else in the timeline so nothing is selected. And then select the clip that you want. So once you have that clip selected, then you can drag this out and you can make this fit. You can make it fit whatever dimensions you want. Just remember that if you are going to enlarge a video that was originally smaller, 
just be careful when you're making a smaller video bigger because you might ruin that resolution. So that's how you would do a different dimension in your um, project file and also for your export settings. So you got the project settings correct and you have your export video settings correct. And that way you have all this ready to go. I personally like to render using QuickTime and 1920 by 1080. And when I have you know, a project with 60 frames, I'll use the 60 frames. But if I have to, I'll do 30 frames. Once you have all the settings correct and your project is edited and ready to go, just press add to render queue. And this is where you'll choose where it gets saved. So either my project folder or on my desktop and then name it. You can title your project right here, Jenny movie save and then that will say warning you do you want to add this to the render queue at a resolution larger than your timeline resolution cancel that's because we forgot to change this custom we just make sure that all your settings are correct <laughs> just make sure all your settings are correct luckily it'll warn you if they're not and that way when you say add to render queue it will not give you a warning and when you press start render it'll render into your designated location and you're ready to go so we pretty much went over the toolbar at the bottom of DaVinci Resolve and we went over the inspector and pointed out how you can edit different things on your clips here in the inspector. Also, there's the video tab, the audio tab, and you can edit your individual clips using these tabs or you can edit an entire track by using the settings on the track settings right here. Here's also the mixer right here, the mixer you can toggle on and off. If you want to make some customized hotkeys, then I definitely recommend checking out the keyboard customization. I'll be sure to link the documents in the video description, but I would recommend also checking out the hotkeys. There's a DaVinci Resolve hotkeys shortcut PDF that you can download, and I'll be sure to link that in the video description. Right here, you can do the keyboard customizations and add your own hotkeys, which can be really helpful. Not only if you want to make up your own hotkeys on the computer, but also if you have a stream deck like I do, you can use your stream deck and add hotkeys on here as well. And that can be really helpful. When you go to file, this is another way to create a new project, new timeline. Um, pretty much whenever I forget where something is that I want, I'll usually just start up here at the file and I'll look and see what these options are and I'll just try to find what I'm looking for. Usually I'm looking for project settings, my project manager. I'm looking to save my project, import a new file. You can also export your project right here. Say you want to share your project with a friend, then you can export that project right here. You can also use this. You can also export your project to use on a different computer as well. Media management. If you're trying to do something like edit your clip and you forget how to do something, then right over here under edit is a good way to jog your memory. One thing that I was just remembering about is the attributes. You can copy and paste attributes from one media file to the next in your timeline. So this one right here, let's say that this media file, we are going to make this really small for some reason. Right click and press copy and then on the other clip, say uh, select it and then right click and say paste attributes. And then it'll bring this up and it'll say which attributes do you want to include? And when you click on this, just everything, that'll be everything. We only just use the transform tool and use the zoom. So that would include the zoom. You can paste your attributes like that. You can select all of those clips and then paste those attributes on multiple clips at once. Here's some other options like replacing a clip, overwriting a clip. You can swap clips. <laughs> Here's some different options for trimming. You can nudge the clip using period and comma. That's cool. So that just nudges it one frame at a time. Actually, I'll be using that quite a bit. So yeah, these are all the other options. Um, you can fade in and fade out. Or you can do that like how we were talking about earlier by right clicking to do the crossfade. You can add a transition. All these things right here are really fun. You can edit your markers right here under the mark tab, under view. There's so many different options for how you're able to view things. And you can also go to your workspace and change the type of workspace. If you forget where certain things are, like where do I go to export things? I forgot. You can go to workspace, switch to page, and um, here's all these pages right here as well. You can also hide some of these. One time I accidentally hid some of my tabs. It's really helpful to find the tabs if you accidentally close them or hide them just by going under the workspace um, and these other tabs up here. And here's the help panel. If ever you have a problem, uh, right here, it'll basically take you directly to the manual and the documentation right here. I personally find a lot of help uh, Google searching my questions or on Facebook groups. There's a group for DaVinci Resolve. 
that's pretty much everything for now, friends. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you learned a couple things. And if you have any other questions about DaVinci Resolve, let me know. If you like this video, check out my other ones. I have some other tutorial attempts. <laughs> I have a few different YouTube channels for my different interests and JennyNexus.com with more information about me. I also have Patreon.com slash JennyNexus. I've also got a Patreon page, so I hope you'll stop by and check it out. That's pretty much it for now, friends. I'll see you next time. Bye.